In the last module for Unit 3, we're going to focus on what happens with chronic training to the cardiovascular system. We're going to go through all the uh, parts that we went over in the structure and function modules and then went over again in the acute. Now we're going to again focus on what happens if you stack acute bouts after acute bouts, otherwise known as training. So we're going to start today by going over and just talking about the basic principles of training for exercise physiology, and then we're going to apply those to aerobic training. The second is we're going to go through each of the little steps that we've talked about um, the last few modules and work through how those respond to uh, exercise training, specifically oxygen consumption and its underlying mechanisms. So if we get started with principles of training, there's two primary, two primary principles of training and one kind of minor principle. The first primary principle is the principle of overload. Overload states that for any type of training effect to occur, a system or tissue must be challenged with an intensity, duration, or frequency of exercise to which it is unaccustomed. And otherwise, in other words, you must go above and beyond what that, what that body is normally used to. Over time, as you um, kind of overload or put more on, on that the system could normally, is normally experiences, what happens is the body responds by adapting to that overload to where it can handle it even better the next time you do it. So each time you uh, work out, what you're doing is uh, you are making these kind of minor adaptations that over time, with continued overload, if you pr have progressive overload where you continue to increase um, either the intensity, duration, or frequency, uh, then you will have these, um, these minor, tiny little changes ultimately stack up, and over time, that entire system will adapt to this new load, therefore producing exercise training effects. Right? The second major one that we'll talk about is specificity. Specificity states that, uh, that a training effect is limited to only the muscle or the cardiovascular systems in which uh, are involved in the activity. Right? So to give an obvious example would be to say if you want to become um, a competitive power lifter, running five miles a day as a way to train wouldn't make any sense, right? The overload that you're producing has nothing to do with the effect you were desired to have, right? And of course, that very polarized example is good, but even when we talk about getting into uh, very specifics of, of training of, you know, uh, for example, in football, is the bench press to increase strength in your chest, is that actually the best exercise for a lineman to do when very rarely are they pushing horizontally, usually it's a lateral push, therefore it may be better to do like an incline bench press uh, in that situation. Again, thinking about just the only tissues that are going to be affected and the movement that you're going to be doing is, um, is what is actually going to have any type of beneficial training effects. And then the minor principle that we have is the theory of reversibility, or as I like to call it, the theory of use it or lose it, right? If you stop using it, then gains are quickly lost. Even if it's not even a, well, I was working out, now I just sit on my couch, but even if you start to lift weights and you decide for, that you are gonna decrease and you're gonna remove the overload, right? Then you won't be seeing any more gains in uh, following exercise. So let's then move this into um, endurance. So endurance training, of course, there are lots of different programs and principles for uh, how to best uh, increase uh, endurance um, or increase your VO2 max. But in general, we can say this. If you use large muscle groups with dynamic activities such as running, cycling, or swimming, um, then you will actually get the, mo the best increase in VO2 max. So why large muscle groups? Again, Oxygen consumption happens in skeletal muscle when it's contracting via aerobic metabolism, as we learned in Unit 2. So therefore, the more muscles we use, the more adaptations that will occur in those muscles, uh, and therefore, the greater the VO2 max. 
general ideas are 20 to 60 minutes, three to five times a week at a moderate intensity from 50 to 85%. Of course, this isn't a hard and fast line. This is just a broad recommendation of something that could work for just about anyone. And indeed, they work pretty well. After exercising at this uh, pace for two to three months, if you were to go from sedentary to just now exercising, most people would see a 15 to 20% increase in VO2 max uh, based on this protocol here. However, if you were already a cross-country runner and already in really good shape, of course, the gains that you're going to see are going to be relatively small and require you to work out at a high, at a much higher intensity than this 50 to 80 percent in order to um, see any adaptations. And again, that it goes back to the overload principle, right? These uh, these highly trained individuals aren't overloading the system at 50 percent and have to work harder. We can also get really huge gains in some people, as high as 50% um, in those who start out uh, in very poor aerobic shape. Um, and sometimes it doesn't even take much, so we can get huge gains. And this comes into play specifically when we talk about exercise as medicine, working with middle-aged to older people who um, have been sedentary for long periods of time and have very low aerobic capacity or VO2 max. Uh, and so we can get huge gains, which pay off very quickly because they're now able to do lots of activities of daily living that they couldn't do before. One other note on endurance training is, unfortunately for all of us, there is some gen genetic predisposition. In other words, I'm never going to have a VO2 max above 80, no matter how hard I train or try. Um, I am not a gifted aerobic athlete, and I likely won't be running marathons, right? And so uh, while I can improve my VO2 max, 15, 20, 35 percent, there is a limit based on genetics to which I can ultimately increase. So let's take a look at this next figure. I'm only going to highlight this column here, but if we look at before training, average VO2 max of about three liters per minute. Again, we talked about this a couple units ago, but there's two ways we can talk about it. We can talk about it in absolute, which is in liters per minute. We can also talk about it in relative, which takes into account body weight, which is mils per kg per minute. This is the one that most people use. Uh, relative is most commonly used and, and what I'll be using um, in most things. And, but just so that you see both, we have absolute here and then in the figure I'll use relative. But as you'll see, four months after training, we can improve VO2 max. If you continue that training, progressive overload uh, and working, uh, endurance training, then you can continue to improve uh, VO2 max from 3.07 to somewhere of 4.36. It's just a, a generalization. We see the same idea here in, in graph format. So on the bottom here, this is what we call a progressive exercise test. If you're in lab, we're doing this in the Bruce protocol. Um, but the idea is that uh, you have several stages that every few minutes you increase the speed and in this situation, the grade, which is here, right? So we make the person work harder, make them run faster, uh, and then we measure ma maximal, or we measure oxygen uptake. We'll hook them into a mask, uh, measure the amount of oxygen that that person is consuming using the mask. And what we typically see here is in this red curve is that as we progress to higher and higher speeds and grades, that ultimately it comes a point where the person can no longer continue. Um, and they stop the exercise uh, at the highest point, and this is what we would determine as their VO2 max. After training, we can improve that. So, for example, here, the VO2 max of this individual is, we'll say, 32. Again, this is in mils per kg per minute or relative. Okay. After training, what happens is you can go longer and uh, uh, and faster, right? So you can continue as the stages increase, you're able to continue going. And in this situation, the VO2 max hovers probably around 58%. So this is a 30 something percent increase in, in VO2 max uh, with training. 
So this is again the, the typical response is that they can go harder and faster. So how do we how do we do that? Of course, our metabolic supply and demand must be equal, right? So our metabolic demand is is dependent on our aerobic metabolism or our oxygen consumption. So how do we meet that demand with supply? We meet it in, uh, by altering one of uh, one or all three of these. So first we have our VO2 max is ultimately going to equal our maximal heart rate times our stroke volume maximum times our AVO2 difference. Right? We've already talked about that. We can group this in as Q, the cardiac output, multiplied by our O2 extraction. And of course, this makes sense, right? This is how much blood we send to the muscle, and then how much oxygen is taken out from that blood when it's there. Right? Those are the two principles, how much blood we can get and how much oxygen we can take out once it gets there. Again, we ended the lecture with, with this uh, yesterday, but this is known as the Fick equation. Right? Yesterday when we saw it, it was just VO2 equals heart rate times stroke volume times a VO2 difference. But in this situation, when we're talking maximal exercise, we're talking maximal parts of each of these. So that's going to be the focus. And as we move now into uh, the next lecture, what we're going to set up is the effects of chronic training on these systems and how they ultimately affect VO2, uh, VO2 max.